Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Freedom Report podcast. Today is Monday, May the 8th. And first, a word from our sponsors. It's never too early to start thinking about your retirement, and there's never been a better time to invest in your future than right now. Adam Puff at Haddon Field Financial Planning is a trusted friend of the Freedom Report and someone who can help you make your money work for you. Don't work hard, work smart. Let Adam work for you. Call Adam Puff at 856-795-0471. That's 856-795-0471 for all your retirement, 401k, estate, small business, and other financial needs. That's 856-795-0471 and get your free consultation today. Securities offered through Securities America, Inc., member FINRA, SIPC. Advisory services offered through Wealth Management Associates, Inc., Haddonfield Financial Planning, Wealth Management Associates, and Securities America are unaffiliated. Welcome back to the show, ladies and gents. Thanks so much for tuning in. As usual, you can always download the Freedom Report podcasts on the go, so you can listen to them in your car or wherever you like at any time. On the Podbean app, you can also find us on iTunes or on Stitcher. Just type the Freedom Report in and you'll be able to find me. Uh, so today I've got a story for you that comes from the National Review, one of my favorite writers over at the National Review, a gentleman by the name of Kevin Williamson, and the type, uh, the article's name <clears throat> is called The Inquisitor's Errors, uh, so essentially talking about the heirs to the Inquisition, and it's got a really funny picture of Bill Nye claiming to hold up the principles of science, and the subtitle uh, that Kevin has dropped here is called Progressives Claim to Love Science. But what they truly love is power. To be a good progressive is to adhere simultaneously to two incompatible notions. One, that science provides the final word on any question about which scientists offer any opinion. And two, that the scientific method is illegitimate, a tool of the sundry atavistic forces conspiring to keep down the female, the black, the brown, the poor, the gay, the disabled, the gender fluid, everybody except Mitt Romney. If you were looking at the college campuses with the right kind of eyes in the 80s and 90s, you could have seen this coming. The more philosophically self-aware progressives have long been ensorcelled by the belief that science, or really big big letter science, right, the the, uh, capital S science, could be pressed into service bearing loads of social management too heavy for a mere bureaucracy. The Soviet Union invested a great deal of its scarce capital in something it called Soviet cybernetics, a sort of Stone Age attempt at using what we'd now call big data to analyze and solve social problems, especially those related to the management of economic production. The old Marxists took their scientific socialism seriously. In the English-speaking world, progressives, under the influence not only of political philosophers such as John Dewey, but also of the engineer and management theorist Frederick Winslow Taylor, fell into something like a cult of expertise. Experts under the tutelage of science could, would, and should decide almost everything. How much steel should U.S. firms produce? How should they produce it? What should the line workers at the factory be paid? What about their supervisors? Taylor's Principles of Scientific Management, published in 1911, provides a testament to the ambitions of the progressive era. He and his contemporaries believed that using such new technological tools as stopwatches and motion picture cameras, one could study industrial processes at the most granular level, how a certain employee turns a certain screw, and produce a single best way of performing any task. There is a great deal of ideology embedded in that belief, along with a great many political assumptions. But Taylor and the others denied that they were engaged in any sort of politics at all. Their business, as they saw it, was science. There is a reasonably straight line from early 20th century progressivism to contemporary Barack Obama-style, quote, pragmatism, which is dishonestly and glibly characterized as simply, quote, doing what works. In reality, it means doing what I want done in the most convenient way. But managerial progressivism, with its implicit faith in hierarchy and its inescapable elitism, was always set for conflict with the more populist and emotional tendencies on the left that came to prominence in the 60s, political currents originating largely in issues of identity. Such concerns uneasily alongside a managerial progressivism based on the wisdom of people who were and are overwhelmingly white, male, and highly educated 
working in institutions built by and for people who were overwhelmingly white, male, and highly educated. For years, this played out as old-fashioned progressive elites exercising a kind of managerial veto over the wilder ambitions of the identity left. Bernie Sanders proposes reorganizing the American economy around the cultivation of organic hemp, and somebody responsible tells him, no. (laughs) This gave the identity left a very strong incentive to work to undermine the prestige of science, a project that was undertaken with great enthusiasm back during the heyday of postmodernism. The academic world endures a lot of voguish nonsense about African science and feminist mathematics and, quote, queer physics. And um, Kevin writes here, my early postulate is that queer physics speaks about knowledge making in physics that takes the form of subverting the hegemony of a dominant and mainstream discourse. The extreme Foucauldian version of that analysis was ridiculous and lame and easy to write off if you were not an academic. But the more moderate version of that view became quite mainstream. We may not hear very much about feminist physics, but we hear about, quote, women's way of knowing. Gay perspectives on this, black perspectives on that, as if there were not as many black perspectives as there are black people. Michael Foucault's lurking malice was reinvented as the motive force in the rhetoric of intersectionality. The belief that the oppression of people with certain characteristics, black, gay, or disabled, is in a matrix of attitudes and discrete Uh, discrete episodes, but a complex nest of social relationships that can conveniently explain everything uh, but uh, but the the phlogiston of identity politics. And just so you know, I'm going to, let me uh, uh, define that for you, for the phlogistonian, for the the non-phlogistonians. It's a, a substance supposed by 18th century chemists to exist in all combustible bodies and to be released in combustion. Kevin likes the big words. So essentially when he, what he's saying here is that the idea of intersectionality is that the belief of certain, of certain people have certain characteristics, right? So if you have, if you're gay or if you're disabled or if you're black, then you have a certain, um, you have a certain view on things is the phlogiston of identity politics. So what he's saying there is that there's some sort of like idea or a substance that exists that, that would be, that can be released just for the fact that you have those characteristics. The Indiana Jones heuristic, the search for fact is science, the search for truth is philosophy, can only go so far in finessing the inherent conflict between science, which is organized around assumptions of objectivity, and the poisonous identity politics holding it as as its fundamental principle that everything is subjective. The scientific view is that true is true and false is false irrespective of any particular demographic or political characteristics of the speaker. And this is the major point of this piece, so I'm going to repeat this sentence for you all. The scientific view is that true is true and false is false, irrespective of any particular demographic or political characteristics of the speaker, right? So it wouldn't matter what color your skin was, it wouldn't matter what your sexuality was, it's not going to give you a, a deeper insight into scientific principles, right? True is true and false is false, whether you are gay, black, white, Muslim, Mexican, other side of the wall, this side of the wall, it just doesn't matter because true is true. Objective truth is objective truth, uh, no matter what identity you are. Though these, of course, may provide grounds for skepticism, right? Who paid for your study is not an entirely unreasonable question. At the same time, the identity left has its uses for science. For one thing, it was a convenient cudgel to use against conservative-leaning Christians distressed by certain implications of evolution, or discombobulated by the possibility that homosexuality is a phenomenon with, with roots that are biological rather than diabolical. That sort of thing is usually the stuff of low-value conversation. A certain kind of eternal adolescent never stops getting a thrill out of scandalizing his retrograde Lutheran grandmother. But if you have a sufficient number of such interactions, and we have no shortage of them, they can become a part of the tribal identity that is the real basis for our politics, however much we might pretend that what we are really talking about is public policy. As the identity left moved out of the communes and into the suburbs, and progressivism became much more strongly associated with the interests and habits of affluent, educated coastal elites, professing one's love of science became an exercise in telegraphing uh, uh, telegraphing status, right? 
But if it were really about science, we'd be hearing more from scientists and less from people who have batty, superstitious attitudes about modern agriculture and uh, evidence-based medicine. You will not hear Democrats complaining about modern agriculture and evidence-based medicine. You will not hear Democrats complaining about the fact that the Affordable Care Act uh, uh, declares the way for subsidizing such hokum as acupuncture and homeopathy. Seventh-day Adventists may make some claims about the world uh, from a scientific point of view, but so do practitioners of yoga and sweat lodge enthusiasts. The public adoration of science isn't about science. science. Which brings us to the recent March for Science and the popular poster boy for all things science, Bill Nye. The March for Science was no such thing. In the main, it was a march for the one thing almost every faction of the left <clears throat> can agree on, a larger public sector. Progressives are culturally at home in, in large institutions, and they have learned how to game these systems pretty well. More funding for science means a lot of funding for things tangentially related to science and a lot of comfortable sinecures related to science in the Vegas way. A great many people with degrees in women's studies or Latino studies have jobs in, quote, science as community outreach coordinators and program officers with responsibilities that might charitably be described as light. It's a safe bet that $100 spent on science gets you about $17.50 worth of astrophysics, with the balance going to, quote, community development, paid political activism, <laughs> yeah, exactly, and overhead. That is not an argument against spending on science. It is an argument for better and more responsibly run programs. And that would be a fine argument to have if we could have an argument, which we can't. Charles Murray, who wrote one of the world's most famous books bringing scientific research to bear on social questions, has in effect been forbidden to speak at college campuses. In one of the most shameful spectacles of contemporary academic malfeasance, Bert Johnson, the chairman of the political science department Middlebury, has apologized for the episode in which Mer Murray was prevented from speaking on campus by rioters. Professor Johnson apologized to the rioters for having had the poor judgment to invite someone to campus whose views are at variance with their own. It could be that Murray's work represents poor science. Some respected parties have exactly made that argument. But what does science have to say about the disputation of claims? The postmodernists were correct in one thing. There is some politics built into the scientific method in that the scientific method assumes an environment in which people are at liberty to speak, debate, and publish, a liberty with which the American left, particularly on college campuses, is at war. They are not interested in debate or conversation. They are interested in silencing those who disagree with them, and they have high-profile allies. Democratic prosecutors around the country are working to criminalize the holding of nonconformist views about global warming. Some prominent activists have openly called for jailing climate deniers. And Howard Dean has taken up the novel argument that the First Amendment does not actually protect political speech with which he disagrees. It is, he insists, hate speech a legally null term in the American context. Dean has argued that the federal laws governing the conduct of political campaigns could and should be used to regulate all political uh, public speaking. The partisans of science believe themselves to be part of an eternal war between Galileo and the Inquisition, but they have in fact chosen the Inquisition side. They have chosen the side of the censor and the index, so long as they get to choose who serves as censor and who manages the index. That is how they have reconciled science and its claims of objective fact with identity politics and its denial of the same. They are engaged in neither the pursuit of fact nor the pur pursuit of truth, only the pursuit of power. Absolutely. And I have another piece that I want to finish off with you by David Harciani, who wrote this back in April, saying that Bill Nye's view of humanity is repulsive, one that I very much agree with. Bill Nye has some detestable ideas about humanity. This shouldn't surprise anyone. Many environmental doomsdayers share his totalitarian impulses. Nye has toyed with the idea of criminalizing speech he, speech he dislikes and has a soft spot for eugenics. 
In his Netflix series, Bill Nye Saves the World, the former children's television host supplies his ver viewers with various trendy notions to adorn his ideological positions with the sheen of science. In the final episode, Nye and his guests contemplate a thorny scientific question, how the state can stop people from having, quote, extra children. Bill Nye says, so we should, have, should we have policies that penalize people for having extra kids in the developed world? Travis Ryder says, I do think that we should at least consider it. Nye says, well, at least consider it is like, do it. Ryder says, one of the things we could do that's kind of least policy issues is we could encourage our culture and our norms to change, right? All of this is pretty familiar to me, and not only because the panel sounded like a chai -com planning meeting. The NICE segment, it turns out, was just a repetition of a 2016 NPR article on overpopulation, featuring writer that I'd once written about. Quote, Should we have policies that penalize people for having extra kids in the developed world, asked writers and others who are pondering, quote, pondering, quote the ethics of procreation. The article is titled, Should We Be Having Kids in the Age of Climate Change? In it, Ryder, a philosopher with the Berman Institute of Bioethics at Johns Hopkins University, scaremongers a class of college students about the end of days and the immorality of having children. The room is quiet, NPR explains. No one fidgets. Later, a few students said they had no idea the situation was so bad. It's not. Here's a provocative thought, Ryder says. Maybe we should protect our kids by not having them. This is provocative in the way a stoner wondering why airplanes don't run on hemp is provocative. That's because the entire case for capping the number of children rests on assumptions entirely devoid of scientific or historical basis. In 1798, Thomas Malthus wrote that, quote, the power of population is indefinitely greater than the power on the earth to produce subsistence for man. At that point, there were maybe a billion humans on earth, so we might forgive him for worrying. In 1800, the life expectancy of the average British citizen, then the leading light of the world, was 39 years of age. Most humans lived in pit pitiless poverty that is increasingly rare in most parts of the contemporary world. Now, I just want to pause here for a second to relate an anecdote to you, and I have to pick on her because she's a friend of mine. But this, if you're all fam not familiar, uh, the Psy Babe on Twitter is a good friend of mine, a woman by the name of Yvette Guinevere, and we agree on quite a few things and other things we don't, but she's definitely pro-science. She tends to take the, I would say, left liberal side on things, you know, Hillary Clinton voter, et cetera, et cetera, but there are some things where we do diverge. She's been on my show a couple of times, but I have to reveal something about something that occurred recently because she was here at the KC March for Science, and this is not so much a, a remark on her as much as it is on the, I would say, the anti-science left because initially, like, eventually, has made a name for herself in debunking a lot of uh, anti-science woo-woo, right? A lot of pseudoscience. So a lot of like, you know, homeopathy and she, she you know, took like overdosed on homeopathic pills as like her big like coming out and she was in the Daily Mail for it and it was a big deal. But she was supposed, she was originally supposed to come to the Kansas City March for Science and she was supposed to talk about GMOs. Now, it's funny because she had all of this stuff where she was supposed to be breaking down why the people who are against GMOs are very much anti-science because the science of GMOs is definitely on the side of GMOs. Um, you know, a billion lives saved by Monsanto and, and by GMOs, by uh, genetic crop modification. But she changed her topic uh, at the March for Science, she, instead of talking about GMOs, where she be, she had to change her topic, and the reason why is because when she sent them over her ideas to talk, the sci the quote unquote science friendly crowd started sending her back emails saying, "Hey, we need to see some facts about this. Our people aren't liking this very much." So, you know, it's very interesting because even Bill Nye, the science guy, has has come out and said stuff against against GMOs. So it's amazing because, you know, these are the people who are supposed to be pro-science, but only when the science agrees with their preordained conclusions. And this is a perfect example because Yvette was supposed to talk about GMOs at the science march, and she got a lot of pushback. So instead of doing it, instead of talking about uh, GMOs, she pushed back and just talked about science in generality. was bashed on Trump a little bit. I was there. I got to see the speech. And it was, it was mostly, the discussion was just mostly rah-rah science, but there wasn't a lot of substance there. And, you know, I'm picking on you, Yvette, cause, again, because we're friends and I still like you, but I think it's, I think it's uh, a perfect example. And you know very well that if you're listening to this show, it's, this is a perfect example of how the left does not hold the moral high ground when it comes to science. It does, their, science does not care. Again, like I said earlier in, in the piece by Kevin Williamson, science, science does not care about your politics, right? 
Just like Ben Shapiro's famous tweet that's posted at the top of his timeline that's been there for like a year. Facts don't care about your feelings. They don't. It doesn't. Facts do not care about what you identify as. It does not. Care, it does not matter whether you're you are black, white. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Science is science. Science is objective truth, no matter what end of the spectrum. And the right and the left both have their anti-science woo-woo. As a matter of fact, the conspiracy theorists of both left and right, whichever side they identify with, tend to agree on a lot of the same things, right? They tend to agree, and, and what they where they agree on are the things where they are against science, where they are definitely pro-woo-woo. That's what they call the skeptics call uh, pseudoscience. We call it woo-woo. But anyways, I thought that was an interesting, interesting story, and it was one that I could relate to you from my own personal experiences. All right, back to the Federalist piece. Now, had Bill Nye been around in the early 19th century, he'd almost surely be smearing anyone skeptical of the miasmatic theory of disease. The problem is that he lacks imagination, unable to understand that science is here to help humanity adapt and overcome, not constrict humanity. Anyway, six billion plus people later, extreme poverty has fallen below 10% for the first time ever. Most of these gains have been made in the midst of the world's largest population explosion. As I've noted elsewhere, according to the World Bank, because of the spread of trade, technological advances, and plentiful fossil fuel, not only are fewer people living in extreme poverty, but fewer are hungry than ever. Fewer die in conflicts over resources, and deaths due to extreme weather have been dramatically declining for a century. Evidence the science guy regularly ignores. Over the past 40 years, our air and water have become cleaner. Despite a huge spike in population growth, some of the Earth's richest people live in some of its densest cities. It's worth remembering that not only was early progressivism steeped in eugenics, but early 70s abortion politics was played out in the shadow of Paul Ehrlich's population bomb theory. Vice President Al Gore has already broached the idea of, quote, fertility management. Frankly, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg mentioned a few years ago, quote, I had thought at the time Roe was decided there was concern about population growth, and particularly growth in populations that we don't want to have too many of. You thought right. Today, abortion is used as a means ex of exterminating a class of humans deemed unworthy of life. Talk about one of the reasons for me to be pro-life. We live in a world where Ehrlich protege Jean Holdren, who, like his mentor, made a career of offering memorably erroneous predictions, can, be, it can become a science czar in the Obama administration. Holdren co-authored a book in the late 70s called Eco-Science, Population, Resources, Environment, that waded into theoretical talk about mass sterilizations and forced abortions in an effort to save hundreds of millions from sure death. Nye is a fellow denier of one of the most irrefutable facts about mankind. Human ingenuity overcomes demand. And this reminds me of a funny sign we saw at the March for Science where someone said that they, they got a vasectomy for the Earth's future. And I, everybody just had to laugh. It was like, yeah, thank you so much because, you know, the, you wouldn't want somebody like that who was, <laughs> was like that having kids anyway. Now, just because something ha hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it can't happen in the future. But the evidence against Malthusianism is stronger now than it has ever been. Of course, not everything about human existence can be quantified. This is the point. Talking about humans as if they are a malady that needs to be cured is at its core immoral. And listening to a man who has three residences lecture potential parents about their responsibilities to Mother Earth is particularly galling. <coughs> Bernie. <coughs> Bernie. <coughs> Bernie. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, had a uh, socialist stuck in my throat. Although many thousands of incredibly smart and talented people, and oh, oh, you can hear the cops, they're coming after me for attacking Bernie. Sorry, guys. <laughs> no, don't take me away. This is what happens when you live in, a, in an apartment in downtown Kansas City. Although many thousands of incredibly smart and talented people engage in real scientific inquiry and discovery, science is often used as a cudgel to browbeat people into accepting progressive policies. Just look at the coverage of the March for Science last week. The biggest clue that it was nothing more than another political event is that Nye was a keynote speaker. We are marching today to remind people everywhere, our lawmakers especially, of the significance of science for our health and prosperity. Fortunately, our health and prosperity has blossomed despite the work of Nye and his ideological ancestors.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to the Freedom Report. If you like this show and you're listening to us live, do us a favor and share on Facebook. Share us on your timeline so that other people can hear the good word of liberty. And if you are listening to us later, thank you very much for subscribing. Again, you can always download the Podbean app so that you can listen to us anytime on the go, in your car, on your way to work, on your way home, wherever you like, on iTunes as well, or on Stitcher. Just type in the Freedom Report. And if you want to do AP a solid, you can also go and uh, give us a five-star review on iTunes. And don't forget, you can get your No Step On Snack shirt at threadsofliberty.com. Have you seen the new cool Threads of Liberty shirt that we've got coming out? Threadsofliberty.com is the exclusive home of the AP collection. You can get your sweet No Step on Snake or Make Taxation Theft Again hat at threadsofliberty.com. Thanks a lot for listening, ladies and gents. Have a wonderful day.